everybody. Welcome back. Uh, now we're going to be talking about uh, Chapter 14, uh, and this is the money supply creation process. And this is about as close to magic as economics gets. We'll see that under certain circumstances, money can be created almost out of thin air. Not quite. I'm only exaggerating a little bit here, but I'm not too far off the mark. And so what we want to do here is think, well, gee, how does the money supply, how does money get created in a financial system? And what we want to see here is that there are four actors uh, in, this, in this game or in this play. We have the central bank. So for the United States, of course, that's the Fed. We have banks, depositors, and we have borrowers. And we want to see how all these four actors work together. Now, in this first part here, uh, we will focus on banks, depositors, and borrowers. borrowers. And later on, we'll uh, bring in and explicitly focus on uh, the central bank and see how it affects the money supply creation process. So again, we're going to be focusing on the latter three banks, depositors, and borrowers here to begin with. So basic background. Uh, without going into very much detail, uh, what we want to get across here is to think about how the banking system operates. A standard bank accepts deposits from folks like us. They then take those deposits, aggregate them together, and then lend them out to other consumers. They lend them out to businesses, and sometimes they lend them out uh, to governments. So you think that's, gosh, exactly what banks do. Banks collect deposits, and they make loans. And that process of collecting deposits and making loans is very important for our money supply creation process, as we will see. And so our types of institutions, we have commercial banks, which are by far the largest. We have savings and loan associations. They're somewhat smaller. And then we have credit unions, which are, are much smaller still on average. If you look at a depository institution and what their balance sheet looks like, and again, this will be important to us, the loan component is by far the largest. And again, that's not surprising. That's why we invented banks and other similar institutions is to, among other things, make loans. They also hold U.S. government securities, so they lend money to the government. They hold other securities. Uh, they hold corporate bonds, for example. They also hold vault cash, so this is when you and I go to uh, the bank and we want to make a withdrawal. The bank can actually come up with the cash to do that. And they also hold uh, what are called reserves uh, with the central bank. In this case, of course, this is the Fed. And these reserves are on deposit with the Fed and the crucial thing to keep in mind here, and this is going to be important for us, not in this video, but later on, that the Fed acts as a bank for banks. So whatever relationship you have with a standard bank, a bank has that relationship with the Fed. And again, that will be important later on. On the liability side, banks have uh, savings and time deposits. Time deposits, of course, for example, would be something like certificates of deposits. To you and I, who own a savings account or a CD, their assets, but to a bank, they become, of course, liabilities. Banks borrow money, so they issue their bonds. And this is going to be very important for us. Checking accounts. To you and I, your checking account balance represents an asset. To banks, that represents a liability. And banks, of course, have to be owned by somebody somewhere so they have owner's equity. We also have to look here, just briefly, at the balance sheet of the Fed. Their assets, their major assets right now are government securities and mortgage-backed securities. They also make loans to banks and other institutions. Their liabilities, they hold reserve deposits from banks. And to them, the money you have in your pocket or the coin you have in your wallet or your purse that represents to the Fed a liability. Now, on to money creation here. So, in terms of how money gets created, it gets done very simply, simply by how banks do what they do every day, by making loans. And we have, and most uh, countries have this too, is what's called a fractional reserve system. So, when you make a deposit, what happens is this. The bank is required by law to keep a certain fraction of that deposit on reserve. What they can do is, of course, loan out the rest of that. So the easiest way to see this is to run through a specific numeric example to see how everything works. So let's suppose you get, you know, you, it's your lucky day. You're walking along and you happen to find $1,000 in cash that somebody else hasn't picked up. So being your lucky day, what do you do? You go down to your local bank and you make a deposit. 
either you have a checking account or you open one up. So you deposit the $1,000 in cash into the bank. And so what we want to do here is see what the bank's balance sheet looks like. Well, when you make a deposit, of course, for you, that's going to be an asset. But to the bank, that's a liability because the bank owes you that $1,000. Because if you want to go you know, write a check against it or take it out altogether, make a withdrawal, the bank has to pay that to you. What happens to the bank's asset side when you make this deposit? Well, right away, what happens is that since it's a checking deposit, and in the United States right now, banks are required to hold 10% of checking deposit accounts on reserve, the bank has what's called $100 in required reserves. Reserves they have to hold against that $1,000 deposit. But what also happens is at least initially, they have $900 in excess reserves, reserves that they do not have to hold against that $1,000 deposit. Now, in general, under ordinary circumstances, what would a bank do with that $900 of excess reserves? Well, they'll do what banks were invented to do. They would make a loan. And so let's suppose they make a loan to somebody named Mike. Well, how does their balance sheet change? Well, nothing on the right side changes because they still owe you that $1,000. However, the left side, the asset side, changes. They still have the $100 in required reserves, and they have that because they still have your $1,000 deposit. But now also notice that they have, they have made a $900 loan to somebody else, right? And so the idea here is that the bank's balance sheet has changed so that on the left side, now they have the $100 required reserve and the $900 loan. So here's what we want to do is we want to investigate where does that $900 loan go? So remember, so we've started with one bank and one deposit and one loan. Well, that's only the beginning of the process. We want to carry on. What happens to that $900 loan? Well, suppose that Mike takes his $900 loan and deposits it in a different bank. Now, we don't need that to happen. We don't need to be deposited in a different bank. We could keep all this same action in within the confines of bank A. But it makes it a little more convenient if we think of this of the uh, of the flow of money here, follow the money so to speak, to go from bank to bank to bank. So now bank B gets this deposit. So bank B gets a deposit just like before, except now instead of a thousand dollars that you found, it's now nine hundred dollars. Well it's now a nine hundred dollar deposit based on that nine hundred dollars and the ten percent reserve requirement this bank, Bank B, has to hold $90 in reserves, and they now have $810 of excess reserves. So just like before, just like with Bank A, Bank B can now make a loan, except now Bank B is limited to not, they can't loan out $900, they can only loan out $810. So that's exactly, that's exactly what they do, is they make an $810 loan. Again, the right side of the balance sheet, and this is important, does not change. And what we want to emphasize here is this. That $900 deposit for Mike and your initial $1,000 deposit, those simultaneously exist. And that's going to be important for us here in just a couple of minutes. So now we get to Bank C. Bank C gets the $810 deposit. They now have $81 in required reserves. $729 in excess reserves. They can then turn around, of course, and then make a $729 loan. And so notice this process simply repeats itself, but on a smaller scale each and every time. So we could carry on here with bank D, E, F, and so on and so forth. But it's all the same process from bank to bank to bank. And that's the crucial thing to understand here. Well, the pattern is this. Every deposit and, and loan, for that matter, is 10% less than the preceding one. And so the question is, well, what happens when this process reduces itself finally to zero? By how much have total deposits and total loans in the banking system changed? And the crucial thing to keep in mind is this. is all of those deposits, your first $1,000 deposit, the $900 subsequent deposit, the next $810 deposit, and so on and so forth, all of those exist at the same time. 
So what we could do is we could do the infinite sum, of course, 1,000, 900, 810, and so on. But that takes a really long time. And so what happens here is because there's a pattern, this pattern reduces to a very convenient, very simple formula. And so all you need to do to calculate total deposits in the banking system is to take your initial change in the deposits right here, that's going to be $1,000, and then multiply it by one over whatever the required reserve ratio is. In our case, that's the 10% figure we've been using all along. So now we go down to the actual numbers, is you take your $1,000 initial deposit and multiply it by what turns out to be 10, and that's how we get the $10,000. So your initial $1,000 deposit that you miraculously found lying in the street somewhere morphs its way into a total of $10,000 in deposits throughout the entire banking system. So that's based on your $1,000 deposit, and that's based on the 10% reserve requirement. And so what we can do here is set up a summary table. So with Bank A, we had your initial $1,000 deposit. We had the initial $900 loan, and that Bank A has to keep 100 bucks in reserve. Bank B gets a $900 deposit. They can make $810 in loans, and they have to keep $90 in reserves. If we kept going through the entire financial system, through banks D, E, F, and so forth, that process eventually reduces to and sums up to the total change in deposits of $10,000 that we just talked about. And that can be broken up in a little bit finer detail that the banking system ended up making in total $9,000 worth of loans and in total reserves in the banking system, and this is important, required reserves in the banking system, total $10,000, excuse me, $1,000. So this represents required reserves. So that $1,000 in deposits, or, or excuse me, $1,000 in reserves supports in total $10,000 in deposits. So it's not an accident that total reserves, $1,000, is 10% of the total volume of deposits. So in effect, what happens is this. Each $1 of your initial deposit supports a total of $10 in overall deposits. And what we saw is that the money supply rises by $9,000. The reason it rises by $9,000 is because your initial $1,000 deposit was already counted as part of the money supply. But once you put it in the banking system, and that process we just talked about begins to take place, total money in the economy, total money supply begins to rise. Now, what happened is this, is you deposited that $1,000 into the banking system. That $1,000 became, as we saw, reserves. Reserves, it turns out, are called, are part of high-powered money. And the reason they're called high-powered money is because they can do a lot of work. They can do a lot of work in this sense. Your $1, each $1 of your deposits supported $10, a $10 change in the total money supply. So in terms of what we've done here, we've calculated what's called the simple deposit expansion multiplier, and that's one over the required reserve ratio. So in our simple example, that turned out to be simply 10. We found the total change in deposits is just our deposit expansion multiplier by the overall change in deposits. And here's what we're going to do in a, another video, is we'll want to see, well, the actual deposit multiplier isn't the same as that value of 10 that we just came up with. And there's several good reasons for that. First, some people hold currency. Because our example that we did, I didn't mention it, but it turns out to be important, is that nobody held any currency. All deposits went into a bank, and then when loans were made, those became subsequent deposits. So nobody held any currency, and of course, that's not realistic. People do do that, so we need to account for that eventually. And in addition, banks also sometimes hold excess reserves, reserves above and beyond that which are required. Our example assumed that banks hold zero excess reserves. And so what we'll do in a subsequent video is we'll get rid of or relax 
both of those assumptions to see, well, what happens in terms of if you deposit a dollar in a bank, how much does the money supply actually change? And it changes by a much lesser amount than our simple example here. And then what we'll also see in subsequent videos is, well, how does the Fed or any central bank fit into this money supply creation process? And we'll see exactly how that works again in subsequent videos. And we're done.